Morning. Thank you all um, so much for coming. Um, I struggled to even convince my partner to get up this early and come hear me talk, so I appreciate <laughs> you all coming. But she does get to hear me all the time, so there's a little bit of, you know, that's okay. Um, I'm Dan, and I'm not a pioneer. Um, in hindsight, I should have changed this title to say I'm a procrastinator because I did all these slides last night and left it late. My apologies. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm that guy. Yeah. So any um, errors, it's based on tidiness and um, tidiness doing it last minute. Um, but yeah, so I'm not a pioneer. But so who am I? Um, as at least said, I'm head of design at Coordinates. Um, I hang out here at the Biz Dojo, um, and recently I've learnt a few things about maps. So. I guess at a stretch, that's kind of connected to pioneering and possibly why I'm here. But, um, however, I think um, it's probably more likely that um, we think of pioneers as um, people that travelled and explored. Um, perhaps someone like John Arrowsmith, who made this map, um, the colony of New Zealand. Um, he made this in 1838, um, back when you made maps with pen and paper. Um, they were also naming the North Island New Ulster and the South Island New Munster back then, so I don't think they really knew what they were up to. Um, they had indigenous Māori names at that point. Um, Te Aki a Māori, meaning the fish of Māori for the North Island, and Te Wai Punamu, meaning the waters of greenstone for the South Island. So my apologies if I mispronounced that, but we really use those names today either. So um, I could have spent the entire talk just showing you old maps, I won't, but um, this is John Arrowsmith, and this is a list of maps by John Arrowsmith. He made a lot of maps. Um, uh, a little bit about him. He came from a family of English geographers. Um, he did much of his work with his uncle's map making, map -making business. Um, had an extensive reputation for being accurate and neat, and he made a... Um, a lot of maps over his lifetime. Um, they're worth checking out. They're all beautiful, like the um, one I just showed. Um, coordinates is not nearly as old. Um, it has been around a few years. So, um, for, you, for those that don't know much about coordinates, I'll give you a bit of background. Um, in some ways, you could say that coordinates has pioneered publishing geospatial data online. Um, what is that? I see some of you may be thinking. Um, it's basically, we get data from different organisations uh, like Land Information New Zealand, um, StatsNZ and others, and we make that data easily available to share and download. Um, in this example, that's Department of Conservation data, there's um, conservation areas and, what was the other one? Um, hunting permits, so combining and overlaying those. Um, you can view all this data together on a map in the browser, um, crop parts of it and download it in any format you want. Um, this all worked long before I joined Coordinates. However, it was in need of a redesign. And that's what the team and I have been up to. So this is what the new app looks like. It's been um, probably two years in the work to kind of get to this point. Um, and this is what it used to look like. Um, this is Wellington Regional Tsunami Evacuation Zones. Um, in hindsight, I should check the status of this building and on that map before we got here, but I think we'll all be safe. Um, so uh, the map is really powerful and really um, complex, um, and the app's been around a long time. Um, and I think what was interesting is anyone that knew it and had used it for a long time got familiar with it. Um, anyone that was new to it um, struggled. So our challenge was taking something that worked really well for existing users, um, but make it... Uh, easier to use with people that weren't as familiar with it. Um, we got there, um, and we're still going on that journey um, in the redesign after running about 100 user research sessions or user testing sessions. Um, and that's kind of what they look like. Um, that's me and James hanging out in his office. Um, it was full of books and maps and gadgets and laptops and computers. and. Um, and pretty much all those sessions, we looked over someone's shoulder to see what they did day to day. Um, and I think being, being open and honest and listening to his feedback, we were able, um, like many of the sessions we had with different users of coordinates, to understand what we were going to change. But I think what was most interesting and relevant to the talk is that most of the people we talked to had 
I guess, a much more pioneering existence than I think I do, or we do on the team. They're often leading research. They're out in the field capturing data and publishing it online. All that is then um, used by people in industry for the projects they work on. So it's these stories and that, um, that research that have led us to come up with this. And this is kind of a, a way that we tell the story about what coordinates does. It's what we call a data life cycle. Um, it, has, it has two sides to the diagram. Uh, in black is the uh, publishing part of the process or workflow of getting data on the platform. And in green is what we call the consumption side and that's using and accessing data. Um, so the consumption process starts with people trying to find data. So that's the crux of what we do is uh, make it easy to find data. Next, the person can appraise data, so check whether it's what they want. So James might have made some data and made it available and someone wants to use it. They're checking whether it's useful. Um, if it proves useful, they can then access it in whatever format they want. Um, then they get to use that data. Um, that, that use of that data then informs the publisher or whoever captured that data. So they've got instant analytics about um, who was using it and that can inform and make them either prepare new updates to that data or um, go out and capture and uh, find other data to publish. We store all online, so that's been the massive change from like, the um, process of storing and publishing geospatial data in the, in the past. And then an organisation that makes it available can kind of press publish and complete the loop and someone goes looking for data and finding it again. Um, so we kind of see coordinates as covering that entire workflow, but there's many other related processes and applications that are required to use geospatial data. Um, all this, to be fair, I knew nothing about um, before I joined coordinates. Um, so it's been pretty much learning on the job and understanding this process along with the team to work out how we could improve the application. Um, I guess for context, this is a tool called QGIS. It's, um, really powerful application that um, quite a few people use to um, either edit geospatial data, uh, make maps in it. Um, uh, in this case, I've taken the data that you saw um, in the app and put it into this application. Um, so I could be editing it, but someone could also be preparing that to publish. So it's used at both ends of the process. Um, so I think what's interesting is like, this, is, this is a really established tool. It's in the desktop. It's hard to use if you don't know what you're up to, um, but that's where a lot of data ends up from the platform. Um, but it's only one part of the problem we're facing. Um, so we're improving people's ability to get data into this application, but um, this is kind of what the landscape looks like for finding data online. Um, there's hundreds of sites. Um, some have maps, many don't. Um, you don't exactly know what data you're going to get. Um, you might download a massive zip only to find it doesn't have what you want or you can't open the data in the format you need. Um, I guess that, yeah, again, so that's the crux of what we're trying to fix. Um, to be honest though, I just spend most of my time looking at maps like this. Um, so this is uh, some of the data from the platform I've downloaded. Um, I didn't really do much other than turn it into black and white and put it up there. It's contour data from Campbell Island, um, and we'll save, well, maybe pop quiz later, but if, if, if you can tell me where Campbell Island is, you might get something. So you can think about that. No using a map to find out. <laughs> um, so it's currently uninhabited, but in the mid 1800s, it was a base for whaling. Um, so going to a deserted island to create a base for whaling feels a lot more pioneering than making maps um, or designing apps. Um, so I guess that's kind of a summary about coordinates, um, what we do, where the data ends up. Um, so I was looking for inspiration about um, Pioneer, um, what it is for this talk. Um, and it turns out when you plug Pioneer into Google Image Search, you get hundreds of images like this. Um, I'm not musical at all. Um, I have very little clue what those buttons do, but they look fascinating to me, and I want to play with that. Um, so seeing this, I briefly thought it'd be hilarious to do the entire talk about Pioneer, the company, because this is not what you turned up to hear about. But, um, talk about skeuomorphism, how cool those buttons are, DJs and so forth. Um, but then I saw the Pioneer logo and thought, nope. 
Um, I was sort of determined to talk about Pioneer though. Um, so I thought uh, maybe I could just talk about all the different DJ decks I've designed and built over the years. Um, kind of an honor of our new Prime Minister. <laughs> DJ just said that. Um, but then I was deeply concerned that what if she didn't use a Pioneer DJ deck? I'd be accused on Twitter for talking about um, this. It'd be fake news, dirty politics. Um, but thankfully, <laughs> her choice of DJ deck worked perfectly for this talk. Um, so continuing this theme, um, it turns out there's a lot of in-depth pioneering reporting about her previous career as a DJ. Um, thanks to the spin-off, um, there's an entire timeline of her DJ success. Um, there's playlists on the internet of um, tracks that she has performed and played in her sets. Um, <laughs> rather pioneering, I do believe. Um, so, the timeline, this is where it gets really interesting. She made her debut at the Morrinsville College After Ball in 1997, where, according to someone there, she played some Spice Girls. Um, her next set was Record Store Day in 2013, and finally her acclaimed Laneway performance in 2014. There's an, even a set list online for that performance that you can um, enjoy. Um, so I kind of guess that's it. My talk doesn't get any better than this. So um, <laughs> thanks, Jacinda. Um, looking forward to seeing what you do as a PM, and hopefully you can continue to progress your DJ career. Um, anyway, rewind. Um, that was the DJ joke that I inserted. Um, uh, great. Um, so I was still trying to understand what um, pioneer meant, um, what pioneering means. Um, and I kind of essentially just went to the dictionary, stopped looking at pictures. Um, and you can kind of read the description, but. Um, like a person who settles um, a region or um, someone that is kind of like earliest to their field. And I kind of thought all that had a lot of baggage um, and still kind of wasn't really what I thought about pioneering. Um, I kind of think it's much more about exploring new lands. Um, you know, potentially, um, yeah, there's a lot more to unpack, but I'll get into that. Um, so essentially it's less DJs, more exploring new lands. So, speaking of exploring new lands, uh, this is Baby Dan, um, exploring Castle Point in the 80s. Um, so it's one of my favorite places. Um, it's where I did a lot of exploring as a kid. Um, but more importantly, anyone that knows me well will appreciate the colored version of this photo more. Um, so you can probably see why my obsession with yellow started. Note the trolley and yellow station wagon that my parents had. Um, and so I think, um, I guess, as Castle Point was already discovered well before my time, um, but one of my earliest memories is from there, I thought it would still be interesting to see, well, is there actually any pioneers in my family? Um, did they discover anything, or were they first that do anything? So I did a search for Newman and maps, of course, um, and I somewhat struck gold, or more accurately, the township of Newman. <laughs> Um, however, with some further digging, I discovered that uh, there were no relation to us Newmans, um, which was deeply disappointing. Um, but from what I could tell, it was a settlement planned um, for an area just off the main trunk line through the Water Upper. Um, it sadly didn't eventuate too much, um, more than a few roads and a railway station, and most of that's long gone. Um, there is um, one thing still left, um, and I'll come to that in a moment, but this is a map of the township, so it was kind of a planned road and plots of land, um, and that's the road that still exists, um, Newman Road. I feel like I should drive up and down it more often. Um, but yeah, no relation, um, and I guess despite finding all that out, um, I think what I kind of uh, realised with pioneering is that in some ways is about being at the right place at the right time. Um, so with that kind of theme, I wanted to kind of run through a few things that I've just been fortunate to experience um, where I ended up being at the right place at the right time 
um, and share that with you. Um, I can see Ben here, but anyone else go to the design school and we're going to be? Oh, just us, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ben's like, cool story, Dan. Um, yeah. um, but I've been and I were lucky, like a lot of people that went to the design school there, we had um, Professor Hazel Gamak. Um, and I think like, she's probably an example of a pretty pioneering woman that um, in 1987 uh, founded the design school there. Um, She'd lived and worked in the US for a long time. She went to MIT. Um, she ran a, a successful design agency, um, an advertising agency. Um, and she somewhat ended up um, in Wanganui by accident, um, but saw the potential to start a design school there. Um, so I guess thinking of that time and realizing like how pioneering she had been to come and establish something so daring in New Zealand was um, pretty inspiring. Um, Looking back on it, one of the lessons I learned, and in hindsight, uh, makes a lot more sense now, was that, and it wasn't unique to being at design school there, that um, I think it was a place for experiencing and using the environment at design school to kind of explore unrealistic projects and non-commercial activities that you may not get to do any time after. Um, so I think that's ultimately it's a great place to pioneer new things. So. Um, Again, Ben, we probably did a few pioneering projects that we wouldn't want to share anymore, that they were um, good attempts as we were um, design students, but it's that safe place where you can make and create something that um, you might not do again. Um, so I guess if you're studying or about to, um, I think based on this experience, I'd use it as a playground to um, try new things, um, work on different types of projects you may not get to do again. And I think as I found it very hard to do that after leaving design school. Um, so yeah, that's a Dan tip. You can hashtag that and um, feedback on Twitter if, if needed. Um, but I guess one, one specific project I do remember that um, just somewhat happened um, by an experience I had. I was laboring over the, the holidays between, um, between semesters. Um, and essentially I got a laboring job where I was pouring concrete. Um, uh, the, the next semester back was uh, a restaurant rebrand project I had to deliver. Um, and I think just over the, the summer break, um, I ended up playing around with that concrete and made uh, a menu uh, stand, a um, couple of coasters, a uh, platter, and a stool out of concrete. Um, it was so impractical. Um, <laughs> the stool was too heavy to kind of get to the Whanganui. Um, the platter was probably difficult for anyone to carry, um, but it was a, an awesome experience using a material that I wouldn't have normally done for a project. Um, and combining that and thinking about that now, I think the, the sentiment is that, um, I guess, I very rarely make things offline anymore, but uh, appreciating making something um, out of a, a raw material was a very rewarding. Um, so, Another example of being in the right place at the right time is the Colossal Squid. Does anyone remember the Colossal Squid? Yeah. Um, so uh, I ended up at a studio called Flightless really early on, that, um, a little cool uh, design company here in Wellington. Um, and they were asked to help Tapapa with a new exhibition. Um, so Tapapa had been gifted this um, Colossal Squid uh, and I think it was 2007. Um, so they found it on a fishing expedition in Antarctica, um, and they're bringing it to the museum. The only problem, and if you all recall, at that point, the squid was frozen. Does anyone know where the story's going? Yeah. Okay, this is pioneering stuff, guys. <laughs> um, so, first project I got to work on was make a website to live stream the thawing of the squid. Um, yes. It was a video, and it was a live stream of the squid thawing. Um, I even had a countdown clock to when the, um, the thawing was going to start. Um, so at this point, there wasn't a lot of live streaming kind of video projects like this. Um, uh, it was certainly the first time a thawing squid had been streamed. Um, <laughs> I guess that's hard to believe, but um, there was also no Facebook Live or Snapchat, so we had to do it on a browser. Um, uh, so that was all really hashtag pioneering. Um, <laughs> we didn't even have hashtags then. Um, 
And if I recall correctly, I was using Safari um, version 3, and the rest of the internet was using IA7. Um, I am still using Safari, though. Um, and all those challenges um, are kind of interesting, but um, we solved the problem, the squid thawed, and it's still in the museum. Um, I guess another, another reminder is that um, a uh, period of time I was in the UK, and I worked at Tiger Spike. Um, and this was only seven years ago, but at that point, phones are nothing like what they are now. Um, tablets weren't mainstream. Um, it, I'm pretty happy to point out at that point, I was happy with my phone just playing Snake, texting, and occasionally having to call people. But um, all of a sudden, I found myself in the midst of a company that was trying to learn and work out how to make apps. Um, there was no guidebook, there was no playbook at this point. It was all of us working together to, um, and make terrible mistakes. Um, and thankfully apps just update. So, and none of you can see and use these apps and work out how bad they are. But um, that, that's all the theme of this that I wanted to kind of get across that. I guess we say now there's an app for that, but at the time there was no app to tell me how to make the apps. And, um, and in this example, this is Al Jazeera. They came to Tiger Spike um, early on. Um, and they were in a bit of a pickle that had an old system for publishing news that didn't really connect to anything like an app. So we had to kind of build the tech to do that, to publish and take uh, their news out of their publishing system and then produce it in an app. Um, and we worked out all this on the go. Um, but I guess despite everyone's best efforts, um, it's kind of impossible to get everything right. Um, we saw other apps launch around the ti same time. They tried different things. Some of those things were more successful. People like, didn't like particular features we did, they liked others, they liked some of the things we did. Um, and all that contributed into feedback and iterating on that. So although we were early on in getting an app to market, it wasn't about being first, it was about improving it over time. Um, so I guess, oh, this is another example of the economists, the same thing with um, them, they had limitations with how they could publish data. They didn't have um, a guideline for how to take their brand and make it digital. Um, they had a really successful website, but no guidelines for mobile or tablet. So building that as we went um, uh, and working with them, we got to a point where we, um, we launched um, several versions of the apps. But to reiterate, um, doing something first in, the, in design is only part of the process. Iterating and learning from that launch was critical, and responding to that feedback and improving things is what made them better. Which gets me back to where I was in New Zealand. Um, zero. So they've done relatively well. Um, I've been long gone, so that's probably why. why. Um, <laughs> but um, it turns out levitating devices aren't pioneering either. These are beautiful levitating devices, though, I have to say. Um, <laughs> And I guess what was interesting at my time at Zero was um, we were sort of in a particularly good sweet spot between um, significant growth and funding that they'd received, um, the scale of the company and the market, um, that we were able to sort of try um, somewhat creative things, um, but also have the budget and support to do it. Um, there's things like this. I didn't work on this, but this is a um, video of Arthur the Treehouse architect. I thought that was relatively pioneering. Zero teamed up with Sandwich Video and made um, a campaign around Arthur, who was a fictitious treehouse architect that needed to do his accounting to keep track of his, um, his success building treehouse uh, tree houses. Um, it was so convincing that someone actually got in touch to um, ask about the treehouse architect. Um, <laughs> but turns out, um, oops, sorry. Turns out that, um, yeah. As expected, Arthur's not real, and he doesn't work as a treehouse architect. Um, so, although I didn't work on this particular video, um, I did some others, and I think I felt really fortunate to be at zero at a point where we got to experiment, um, learn from some of these opportunities, and continue to evolve the brand into uh, where it is today. Um, and after zero, that gets me back to coordinates. Um, we have no levitating devices. We have plain montages, but one day we might have um, the budget to do photo shoots and um, prop up our levitating devices. 
Um, but I guess, getting back to coordinates, one of the things I realised the most whilst being um, uh, working on the app and looking at the ecosystem and people using the, um, the data, um, there's a lot of opportunities in this space. Um, all of that can seem hard though. Um, and I think like trying to start an empty sketch file or a blank canvas or an empty slide, um, trying to find those creative solutions to those problems um, or improvising on a budget to get something done, it is really hard work. Um, and just when you think you cracked it um, or found the idea that's gonna solve your problem, you come to realize that someone's done that before you. Um, and at first that can kind of feel bad, but I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if you're like me and it's a personal project, you probably try buy a domain name, and then you realize that someone else has already bought it or thought of it, and then you just start going through the extensions until you find one that works. And, and then at that point, you kind of check out the sites and go, actually, someone has done this better and, um, before me. Um, and that's happened twice recently, and I want to share those experiences. Um, so sitting on a whole bunch of data, um, maps, and I thought I should do something with this, um, so I was like, I'm going to start printing some maps. It wasn't a very um, compelling leap, but I'm going to print some maps. Um, turns out, though, that um, Mapperful had thought about that way before me and had solved the entire process of building a site. You can search for the city you want. Um, you pick a style. Um, it gives you the coordinates. It frames it or sends it to you in a tube, and it's pretty much the, the perfect print-on-demand service. I'm like, but I have the data, I work at coordinates. Why have I not made this thing? <laughs> um, turns out Mapperful had made it before me. Um, so yeah, in some ways, they beat me, to the, um, beat me to this, but they did it extremely well, and credit where credit's due. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it that well. Um, but not to be um, disappointed for too long, I was like, right, well, they've done maps. I'll do T-shirts. So started thinking, I'm going to print maps on T-shirts, um, only to go back to the internet and find that uh, in 2015, a company called City, C-I-T-E-E, -E, which was a pretty clever name in URL, I thought, um, they'd launched a successful Kickstarter campaign um, and printed T-shirts on a map. <laughs> so Although like my first endeavours to try and think of something um, to do with the data and, um, and create a side project ended up in a place where someone had already done it um, and done it extremely well in both cases, um, I kind of thought I could use this as a useful lesson of doing things for myself, not to launch um, and, and turn something into a, co a commercial success. Um, so. I, I'm not wearing my printed map t-shirt, I just realised, so that's ruined the punchline. Um, <laughs> anyway, imagine I'm wearing my um, printed map t-shirt. Um, so I think that, that opportunity is, um, it's still there to do it even though someone has come before you. Um, and I guess, I kind of want to drill in on that, that non-commercial success or doing something that um, isn't to launch um, for those reasons. And I think, um, a great example of that is Ecosaur. So, do many of you know about, much about Ecosaur? So many nods. Um, this is Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm and um, Melanie um, Rands, they started Ecosaur in Northland, and it was a permaculture eco village in 1993. Um, so, we all think, and if we know Ecosaur, you'll see it in a lot of supermarkets it's all over the place. But they started in a really humble place with. Um, uh, a, mail or, a mail order service for products. Um, they weren't able to make their own products, but they wanted to source and find really um, high quality, sustainable, environmentally friendly products. Um, and they started just um, sharing those and um, sending them away uh, to like-minded people and friends that needed them. Um, and I think um, essentially they ended up in a place where that became successful. Um, and they got to a point where everything um, from the ingredients to the, pa the packaging they were able to carefully consider and create something that had um, the least impact to our planet. Um, at the same time they were doing this, and year on year as the, the enterprise uh, succeeded, they established at the same time fair the Fair, fair Ground Foundation, and a percentage of all their uh, profit from the Ecosaur Fund goes into this organisation. Um, and their goal is to 
be creating healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy planet. And I just see that and think that's just so important in our time. Um, they were thinking about this in 1993. Um, so I guess pioneering used to mean um, exploring and settling new land. Um, and I think, yes, there's still places to explore. Um, but, I but I believe we now need to think about pioneering new ways to save our planet. Um, I think Ecosaur is one of the great examples of many organisations that are doing their part. Um, and at least read the description of the CM theme. Um, and it said, whether the work was inspired from being on a ship or inside a studio, pioneers act on their internal immutable desires to create work that matters. And I really centred in on that work that matters. Um, I think it's less about whether you're a pioneer or if you did something first, but more about something that matters. It doesn't have to be your day job. Um, it could be changing habits, anything from reducing plastic in your life um, to volunteering for a charity, donating your time or money. Uh, whatever it is, I think if we work on it together, we'll hopefully make a difference. That's it. That was hashtag Dan Talk. Um, you can.